Ba -ba -da -bum. Greetings all again. Last Outrider here with part four of the Underworld War. Carl Tall reached Danehold three days later. The city lay in dust. A skyscape of toppled towers and dead spires, with streets torn and raw in the wake of tank treads. The chasm scars of orbital bombardment were graven deep across the city's fallen districts, where lance fire raked its way across the population centers and slaughtered the city before it even knew it was under attack. He had fought here after making planet fall. He had fought his way through the burning city, throwing himself at ultramarines, shield walls, or firing back from behind barricades of trembling rock and ruined bodies. The running firefights had none of the claustrophobic choke so omnipresent in the overplayed in the underworld. Bolters had fired that day without echoing against the confining stone. How good it had been to fight freely. He had even flown, spreading his wings to soar above the embattled streets, firing at will on the helpless warriors below. But that was then, and this is now. Karutal ventured into the city, making his way down the silent roads, walking around shattered tanks and fallen buildings. Spires still rose in ruined grandeur, their sides blasted open to the light of the lethal sky. Bodies were skinless, sinuous bones many fallen into the Rock Creek ground in reach of inactive las guns and solid shot rifles. Many more had died unarmed, huddled together or alone, some with their remains scattered across roads or plazas, others squatting in corners or ducking under cover. Perhaps instinct had sent them fleeing and scurrying in those last moments. Perhaps they had died when the sky rained fire, or when the war master's allies brought Kalth to heal with bolter and blade. Mere minutes into the city, he found his first word bearers. Kautal thudded to the ground, boots cracking the rockcrete as he hit, and bunched his wings to his back. The avenue was a scene from the visionary's sketch of a pre-unity mythic hell. With ultramarines and word bearers gone to the bone, with their armor splitted by spears and making barricades with their own bodies. He walked amongst the dead, letting his fingers brush delicately over their broken ceramite. One ultramarine was nothing more than powder and armored fragments beneath a fell blade's treads. A lone armored arm reached out from beneath the dead tank as the only indication that a warrior had died under there. One of the word bearers was lanced thrice through the chest pinned to the stone wall of a habitation spire. Four hundred dead warriors 
and the bones of their war thralls at their feet. A low hum pervaded the scene, setting Karutal's teeth on edge. Some of the dead Space Marines' suits of armor were still active after all this time, still thrumming in tune with their back-mounted power packs. It was one corpse in particular that most drew Karutal's eye. He approached it with a certain confident caution, the way a medium might prepare to make contact with the restless dead. The slain word-bearer's armor was decorated with gold ruins and god sigils on in arterial blood the markings of the inscribed karutal knew the chapter well hello jarvash he said to the impaled captain jarvash did not reply Jarvash did not move at all. Karotal reached down to his brother's helm, unlocking the seals at the dead warrior's collar. A serpent's hiss of vented air pressure allowed the helmet to come free, and he looked upon the dry leather skull that had been Jarvash's face. The smell of decomposition, freed at last as a gaseous corruption intense enough to make Karutal's eyes sting. As a child on the streets of the city of gray flowers, he had seen blood fly eggs burst open in the belly of a dead dog. This smell was the same. He had evolved past disgust, but not past the bite of bitter memory. You died badly, Jarvash. His tone stole any possibility of the words being a question. But then, doesn't everyone? The skull stared back, its hollow eyes sockets, neither knowing nor agreeing, merely pits to display the absence of life and personality. Karutal let the helm drop to the road and reached for the ornate dagger sheathed at the dead warrior's hips. More god ruins marked the rusted blade. Another memento. Another chapter to remember. He turned away, stretching his wings and bunching his muscles to leap scarward. Karutal, the corpse, said the corpse behind him. A year before, Kalf. In the days that followed Istvan V, Karutal had been summoned to the Fidelitas Lex. He had anticipated delivering a report on the twisting ruins casualties from the killing fields, or perhaps a briefing regarding the new recruitment to ease the savage losses that they had sustained fighting against the Raven Guard. He had, of course, assumed wrong. He had actually been summoned to his death. Arjel Tal, the Crimson Lord, was already spoken of in whispers across the fleet. He and his men, the so-called Blessed Sons, had shown the truths of their divine forms. They were God-touched no longer human or legionary, but
but a sacred bonding of flesh and spirit possessed in the crudest terms ascended by any other judgment the crimson lord waited in the funerary chambers aboard the lex watching servitors raise bronze and marble statues of those slain in the recent massacre arjal tal wore the red ceramite not yet adopted by the rest of the legion he would soon change as they armored themselves in arterial crimson before the betrayal at kalf his face was the dusky tan of all desert-born word bearers and his eyes showed a repression of emotion that danced somewhere between unshared pain and unreleased anger he spoke in two sort of voices now his own soft tones and the bass rumble of the thing inside him Karutal was no longer sure of Argel Tal's rank since his change and said as much that brought a tight tense smile to the other warrior's lips Gal Vorbach Argel Tal replied for now the crimson lord would soon create the Fakrash Jal, the chapter of consecrated iron. But Karutal had had no idea of it back then. Even if he had, it still would not have aroused his suspicions. Not so soon after their victory on Istvan. Arjal Tal said nothing more. He was watching the servitors raise a statue of a slender young woman in a flowing dress robe. It's true, then, Karutal ventured. The blessed lady has fallen. Warriors fall, Arjaltal turned to Karutal, his words punctuated by the slither of lengthening teeth. She was murdered an ill omen karutal said quietly i will not argue with that the other warrior replied they settled into a companionable silence for several seconds watching the servitors work why was i summoned karutal asked him have i displeased Lord Arulian far from it he wishes to offer you a gift something in the Gal Vorbeck's tone made Karutal's skin crawl he repeated the words with a measured neutrality a gift you have a choice the Crimson Lord was either deaf to the brother's trepidation or chose to ignore it. Lorgar has bid me to increase the numbers of the Gal Vorbeck. He desires more blessed sons among both the Kalf assault force and the fleet's task to spread across the Ultramar. Karutal's breath caught in his throat you can do this mesh flesh and spirit at will the primarch has asked and i will obey hindsight was a treacherous boon all too often what might have been was tantalizing and worthless in equal measure a hundred questions raced through Karutal's mind in that moment. Questions of blood and pain 
and the body horror of sharing your flesh with an alien entity. And Arjal Tal would have replied with honesty, for he was no deceiver. He would have spoken of the changes, the retching and wrinking of bone, the boiling of blood, and the madness of two voices sharing space inside one mind. Bakautal asked none of these things. His racing heart refused anything but the fierce rush of temptation. And my choice? Arjatal nodded, nodded, knowing in that moment just how this would end. You can starve yourself of all nourishment and carve holy symbols across your flesh, he told Karotal. Purify your mortal form for the union to come. You may have them return to me if you hear the calling of the Neverborn from behind the veil. You may have then returned to me if you hear the calling of the Neverborn behind the veil. If you survive the ritual, then I will offer you a taste of my blood to begin the communion and lead you into a new life as one of the Gal Vorbeck. The Neverborn will never refuse such a devoted host. Starvation purification, trances and visions, and scarification. He did not fear the trials, for he knew no fear. Even so, he hesitated at the mutilation of his flesh. What if he failed the offering? What if he could not fully recover? What if he required extensive bionics even to stand and fight with his brothers in the future? You mentioned a choice, Karutal prompted again. I did. You may undergo the necessary purifications, as I have explained, or you can risk a cruder more abrupt offering. And I pray the Neverborn deem you worthy for union. That is how the first of us accepted this gift, though we didn't realize what was being offered at that time. What if I choose the quicker path? Karutal asked. It is much more dangerous, more likely to succeed, but failure brings death. But if I choose it, Arjotal gathered the right words. It was different for each of us. Some saw nothing but blackness, others saw our pasts, and others, such as Zafin, Arjotel gestured to another statue being lifted onto a plinth, Zafin saw the future. He saw what might come to pass if the future unrolled along one of its many thousands of possible pathways. Aljotal needed no time to prepare an answer. I will walk the same path you walked, my lord. His eagerness did not make Arjeltal smile. Again, with hindsight, that would have been something he looked forward to. Then, once we are in the warp, I will take you to a specially unprotected part of the ship, away from the timberous guardianship of the Gellerfield. You will offer what I 
offered and do as I did. What should I offer? What must I do? Arjaltal drew a golden sword, clearly of Terran make, forged for the fists of the legion's custodes. It should not have flared into life in his hands, and yet the blade did just that. Little lightning snakes rippled down the stolen steel. You must offer your life, Jerodai. He rested the tip of the blade against his brother's throat. You must die. And that was part four. Until next time. Bye.